Hey guys, how's it going? Mike Loria here, and this is uh, Approaching Aristotle, looking at how we can really strive for brain-friendly teaching and training in pre-hospital retrieval medicine and critical care transport. So my Twitter handle is RecessPadawan. Feel free to uh, tweet this out, follow me, look at the conversations that we're, uh, we're having on Twitter about this kind of stuff. Uh, before I get started, uh, I have nothing to disclose. I don't have any conflicts of interest. If I talk about any products or um, I discuss any research in this presentation, it's because I think it's good science or because I think it's a good product, not because I'm making any money off it. So to start out, what is brain-friendly teaching? When I talk about brain-friendly teaching, all I'm talking about is looking at how we train people or uh, teach information to people and kind of aligning it better with the natural cognitive mechanisms that we possess, the natural neural, uh, neurochemical processes that are going on in our brains. And I want to look at this in three ways. One, information transmission. So how we share knowledge, data, facts, that kind of stuff. Cognitive abilities, looking at uh, how we train people to solve problems or make clinical decisions. And finally, technical skills. So I absolutely love physiology. It's one of the main reasons I went to medical school, and I can't tell you how much I was actually looking forward to a couple of classes. One in particular was uh, respiratory physiology and gas exchange. But within, I don't know, less than five minutes of being in the class, my excitement was dashed to pieces as the professor just kind of stood there, uh, turned around almost with his back to the class, and just started reading off the slide really quickly. And uh, it was a terrible experience. I mean, half the class just got up and left because no one could follow him. It was confusing and frustrating, and, and everybody left uh, uh, just really upset. It was a, not a good experience. And, you know, after that, you know, we had to go to biochemistry. Well, I really wasn't looking forward to that. I know that material can be dry, and it can be really dense, and, uh, and it wasn't at all. It was incredible. And the professor told stories about guys like this, guys like Agostino Levinson, who submitted himself to these crazy starvation uh, trials and this crazy starvation research. And in addition to that, the, the professor tugged at our heartstrings with these sad stories about, uh, about patients' uh, children in, in Africa and the famine that was going on in, in Africa. Uh, and all along the way, he weaved in these, these metabolic uh, and uh, molecular tidbits of how things were actually working in their bodies when they were experiencing these things. And uh, we learned so much because it, all of these stories and all of this emotional information or presentation was infused with um, the biochemical information. It was just amazing. I mean, we left there feeling like, like superheroes, really, because you, you really learn a lot. You feel really good about yourself. You walk away feeling like you've increased your knowledge, which is essentially what the class is supposed to do, right? But this tremendous disparity, this dichotomy between how these two classes were taught really asked, uh, led me to ask the question, why do we teach the way we do? You know, what uh, what drives our practice that way? Is it just what we've always done? Is it really based on the data and the information that we have available to us? I don't know. And it left me asking, can we improve the way we teach? Can we do it better? And I think that's absolutely true. And not just in medical school, but in paramedic school and nursing school and every element of out-of-hospital and critical care training. I think we can. I think we can apply our conventional understanding of how the mind works and improve the way we teach. Granted, I think we're just beginning to unlock um, the 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 underpinnings of how our brains really work and how we learn. Uh, we've we've discovered a lot, but I think we still have a long way to go. Well, that said, looking back through history, when I think about great teachers, I think about this guy. I think about Aristotle, who was renowned as being an amazing teacher. In fact, uh, prominent Western and Eastern philosophers in the ancient world referred to Aristotle as the first teacher. He was the mentor, teacher, and trainer of Alexander the Great, and he went on to establish one of the most prominent uh, 
uh, institutions of information and knowledge exchange in the ancient world called the Lyceum. He was also the father of empiricism. So people before Aristotle essentially believed in the concept of rationalism, that we, we learn about the world best by essentially just sitting there and thinking about it, by pondering it. And Aristotle said, nah, that's not really it. He kind of turned that idea uh, upside down. He turned it on its head, and he said, the way you uncover the truth, the true uh, essence of the natural world around us and figure out how it really works is by going out and experiencing it, by experimenting, by testing the world around us. And I think that's that rings true with what we believe as far as evidence-based medicine is concerned. So what would Aristotle do? How would he, how would he approach this problem? Well, when I think about that, I, I refer to the three uh, ways that Aristotle believed that we communicate with people and we get then we persuade them to uh, think a certain way or believe a certain thing. And there were three ways he believed you could do this. One was uh, an appeal to your personal credibility, to your authority, basically, you know, your resume, your CV, and who you are. The other was logos, so logic, um, using data and science and research to support your claim and show people. Um, or appealing to people's emotions, pathos. So these are the three things or three ways he believed that we could uh, persuade people of, of things. And his, historians seem to believe that Logos was Aristotle's favorite. So that's what I'm going to go with. I'm going to look at the logic and the data behind uh, how our brain works and try to apply it to how we teach. Because we, practiced evidence -based, we practice evidence-based medicine. Why would we not practice evidence-based education. Well, before we get going on the three things, I want to go over an important concept, because essentially everything I talk about from here on out is predicated on this concept, and that is cognitive load. So if you imagine this circle is the cross-section of a wire, and uh, in the 1980s, a guy by the name of Sweller developed this theory that uh, essentially any person at any given point in time has a finite load that their mind can handle of learning things or absorbing information, essentially a finite bandwidth. So this, this circle is sort of like the cross-section of a wire. And that cognitive load, that bandwidth, is comprised of several different things. The first is the germane load. This is sort of the unconscious load, uh, the energy that your brain requires to process information and store it in your memory, to connect it to other things that you've learned, and to build these constructs in your mind's eye of how things appear. So that's the germane load. There's also the intrinsic load. So the intrinsic load is essentially how difficult or easy material is. So 5 plus 5 equals 10. That's relatively easy. So it would be a low intrinsic load. Uh, if I was to try and teach someone um, the differential equation that models how fluid flows through a pipe or a blood vessel, that's a little bit more complex. So the intrinsic load would be higher. And there's one last very important piece, and that's the extraneous load. And the extraneous load is the load that's put on the learner or listener by uh, the speaker or the teacher, how you present the information. If you present it really clearly and concisely, the extraneous load is low. If you present it in a really confusing and convoluted manner, the extraneous load is much higher because people have to think much harder and pick through what you've said or how you've presented it to try and draw out the important information. So the extraneous load, to me, is most important because it's the thing we can probably control the best, right? If we decrease the extraneous load, uh, as you can see here, we actually have a little bit of space. We can teach people more, perhaps. Or if we decrease the extraneous load, we can increase the intrinsic load so we can teach someone something that's slightly more complicated. So that is cognitive load. Now on to those three areas knowledge, cognition, and skill. Well, we're going to start our journey talking about knowledge. There has been so much research done on 
how we get people to learn things, to memorize things, to understand things better. There's uh, tons of stuff in the education literature uh, predating the 1950s on, on how best to do this. Well, I've tried to distill it down to five things I think we can do um, in in pre-hospital medicine and critical care transport uh, on a regular basis, five things we can do on a regular basis to improve or enhance the way we share information or teach people things. And I call them the five T's. The first T is time. So it's really kind of interesting. If you think about uh, any con the average conference or uh, school, former schooling, or uh, even in our jobs, continuing education, we always book things in blocks of hours because that fits nicely on a schedule. It's convenient, right? It seems like a nice even number, one hour. Uh, but really, that has no connection to cognitively how your brain works or how your brain learns best. In fact, going back to the 1970s, there are several studies that show that um, really our attention span, that the ideal optimum time frame for us to learn is really limited to about 15 to 18 minutes. That's why TED Talks are cut off at 18 minutes. Um, there are some later studies, for example, uh, one in The Lancet that suggested that uh, that number might be a little bit longer, that uh, the ideal time frame may go out to about 20 to 30 minutes. But essentially, everybody agrees it's much less than an hour or two. Well, why is that? Well, for a couple of reasons. First, whether we realize it or not, it actually takes energy. It actually takes input to to focus on what someone's saying and process that information. And you can get fatigued. That, that, that concentration, that ability to focus can become fatigued after a certain period of time. The other thing is you can experience what some uh, neuroscientists call cognitive backlog. So there's actually sort of this lag time between when you become conscious of something that I'm saying or something that I'm presenting to you and when it actually gets stored in your working memory. Well, if I present things too quickly or I go on for too long presenting things, that information starts to back up. And if it backs up too much, then it just sort of washes over you. There's a backlog and you don't really remember that information very well. So what's the solution? Keep things relatively short. Try and condense things to 20 to 30 minutes at the most. And in our world, you know, a lot of these complex physiological phenomena are talking about um, individual technical skills or or procedures can can uh, be longer than it can take longer than 20 or 30 minutes. Well, the solution to that is easy. Just every 20 or 30 minutes, take a three to five minute break or so, and give people's brains a rest. Let them kind of catch up. Number two is tell a story. So stories are probably one of the uh, oldest, uh, most effective ways that we share information with one another. We do it formally and informally. We do it uh, in case studies and uh, uh, we do it in presentations of patients, but uh, we also do it informally at the firehouse or at the hangar or even when you're at the bar with a friend. And it works so well because we identify with one another when we tell stories. We recognize uh, pieces of information in what, in what someone's telling us about a patient or a place or a time and, and kind of think, yeah, yeah, I, I've been there. I know what that's like. And it's, this actually generates a very interesting uh, neuroscientific phenomenon. It's called speaker-listener neurocoupling. So if you were to do an fMRI of, uh, of an audience and me while I'm telling a story, interestingly enough, very similar parts of our brains light up on fMRI. And this coupling actually facilitates learning. Also, stories are usually filled with sensory stimuli because we tell people about what something felt like or what something smelled like or what it looked like or what it tasted like. And filling a story with sensory information like that sort of gives you this pre-packaged schema for your brain to recognize. It's, it's much easier. You don't have to spend the energy to draw the picture in your brain because it's already kind of formed with the information that the person is giving you. So here's a picmonic, and this is something that 
medical students use to help us learn information, especially when there's a lot to be learned. It's uh, a concept for, uh, for example, in this case, the vitamin niacin that's attached to this weird, funky, psychedelic looking picture and accompanied by a 30 second uh, audio strip here on the bottom. And so this one for niacin, uh, I'll go through real quick. So niacin is vitamin B3. Niacin represented here by the nice sun uh, looking down at the B in the tree shaped like a three niacin B3 uh, and the the B is actually smoking so represented here there's that cigarette up top and why is that important well uh, cigarettes have nicotine and niacin is actually the metabolic precursor to uh, the molecule nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide which is sort of like the dump truck that takes electrons from the citric acid cycle and it brings them over to the electron transport chain where they can be used to make ATP, the, the uh, required metabolic fuel for so many processes, right? Well, uh, niacin is actually synthesized from tryptophan, which is represented here by the tritophan. And when you don't have enough niacin, when you're in the shade where there's no nice sun, no niacin, you're actually um, predisposed to getting the disease pellagra. You can get pellagra which is vitamin B3 deficiency, represented here by this pelican, pellagra, and he's sitting on the toilet, so diarrhea is a symptom of pellagra. Also, there's this old man here with the D in the question mark. Dementia is another symptom of pellagra, and also dermatitis. So you can see right here there's this rash on the, uh, on the pelican. So that is uh, niacin in a nutshell. Uh, works pretty well. I think it's pretty helpful and uh, bought me about five points on my biochemistry exam. So not going to complain about that. Number three, the technical elements. Man, oh man, we could go on and on for days just about the technical elements of a presentation. And there are many people, uh, people much smarter than I am, that have published quite a bit and uh, in some cases made a very lucrative business out of teaching people how to present information visually. And, and I would definitely recommend people check out uh, any one uh, of these books for tips and tricks. Um, but I would say what it boils down to is one important concept, and that is that how your eyes see things, how you process visual, visual information is, is connected to how we learn and how we remember things. So here's a picture, and this picture basically uh, looks at um, how your eyes look at different things on a slide, for example. So people looked at, uh, spent quite a bit of time looking at this area down here, whatever this is, and also at the baby's face. And you can see here their eyes were sort of drawn to the beginning of this paragraph and these title lines. But you can see here that uh, it sort of fades off. They just kind of glance over this information, and they glance over this text in the paragraph. So if what you want to teach people, the information you really want to get across them is somewhere in this paragraph, guess what? They're not seeing it because they're focused on the title. They're distracted by this baby's face, and therefore they're not processing it, and they're, they're probably not going to remember it very well. So it's actually important how you set things up. Um, so when you're actually writing or presenting words, for example, the size really matters, making sure that people aren't squinting or struggling to see uh, based upon how small the type is, the type of font. It's not some weird, crazy italics that you have to spend a lot of energy trying to decipher. It's very clear, easy-to-read text. Uh, contrast, light on dark or dark on light, so it's also easy to see. And number of words. Uh, if you have a slide that's just caked with you know numerous bullet points and text going from one side of the slide to the other, it's going to be like in that, that last slide I just showed you where people kind of scan over most of it. And finally, limiting distractions. So just like the baby, if you have pictures of helicopters or ambulances or weird images and icons dotted around the slide, that's going to distract people's attention from what you really want them to learn, understand, or discuss discover. If you want to learn more on this, I'll direct you to a couple places. So I put these QR codes in here. So if you're watching the video, you can just snap a picture of the QR code. This one's by uh, Dr. Ross Fisher. 
This is another great one by Dr. Petra Lewis on brain-friendly teaching, where she reviews or, or goes over uh, the science behind seven things you can do to uh, improve your uh, slide presentation and make it slightly more brain-friendly. So four is tying ideas together. So it's really interesting. When you present things in a novel way or present information that ties ideas together for people, so they have these aha moments that realize, oh, that's how that works, or man, that makes sense to me why that patient was like that now. When those moments happen, it sort of shores up that information in your brain. Uh, and what's more is it actually activates a particular part of your brain called the nucleus accumbens. And this is uh, an important part of the reward center in your brain. So when we learn something cool and new and we kind of feel a little happy, it activates uh, dopaminergic, center, uh, dopaminergic transmission in the reward center in your brain. Just like when you, when you drink a beer that you really like or you eat a dessert that you really like, it feels good. And what's really cool about that is it's sort of like the neurochemical save button in your brain. We remember those experiences because they feel good. Uh, so helping tie things together actually helps people remember stuff. Finally, testing and recall. So taking quizzes and tests is probably one of the most uncomfortable parts of any learning experience, but as it turns out, it's actually really important. So I like to think about it as you're hiking in New Hampshire in the winter, and there's new snow on the ground, 18, 20 inches of snow. And when you hike up a trail through the woods, through uh, that fresh snow, it's actually pretty difficult. You have to you have to break trail and tromps through all that snow. But as you wear the trail down, as you beat this trail down, it's much easier to travel. You don't have to push all that snow out of the way. You can move faster up and down the trail. And the same thing is true in your brain. When you practice recalling that information, um, you actually strengthen the neurological pathways uh, and enhance your ability to retrieve that information from your memory. That's really important because that's exactly essentially what you're going to have to do at 3 o'clock in the morning in the back of an ambulance or the back of a helicopter is pull those pieces of information out of your memory. So it's a really good idea to practice that. So again, the five T's, time, tell a story, watch the technical elements, tie ideas together and present new and novel ideas, and test and recall information. So it's kind of interesting. When I present this live, what I do now is I actually tell people to take a break. We're right around 22 minutes right now, so I know that people's uh, attention span is, uh, is probably falling off a little bit, and that's okay. So... What, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, take a little break here, usually give people about three to five minutes. Uh, I was recently at the Critical Care Transport Medicine Conference, and what I did was I showed them this. This is uh, a QR code that leads them to uh, Min Lekong's uh, uh, farm website, pre-hospital and retrieval medicine website, and a video preview for SMAC. So let them watch that for a minute or two. Um, people want to grab coffee real quick, let them do it, and then right back into the game. So if you need a three or five minute break, go ahead and take it. Feel free to pause this. Otherwise, I'll keep going on the video recording or the audio recording. So we went over knowledge, but what about cognition? How do you train people to make better decisions or to be better critical thinkers. It's slightly more difficult, and there is less, I would say, research in this particular area, but th that uh, relatively small body of research is growing rapidly, and since the turn of the century, really, we've learned so much about this. And I think one concept to keep in mind uh, is that we used to believe that your intelligence was essentially immutable. You were born one way, you were born smart, you're going to die smart. You were born uh, not very good at uh, uh, problem solving, you're going to die not good at problem solving. And we know that that's absolutely not true. Your brain is incredibly plastic, and we can actually train people to uh, think better or problem solve better inside a clinical context. One of the ways we can do this is simulation.
So again, there's a small uh, but growing body of evidence that uh, actually putting people in simulations and having them make challenging uh, decisions, uh, clinical decisions about what to do about a patient or solve very challenging clinical puzzles is a great way to develop this capacity. Even things like uh, making them solve problems on the fly, like giving them piece of, uh, equipment that are that are broken or malfunctioning, or uh, in introducing distractions that, uh, like uh, angry parents or uh, confused combative loved one into the scenario that they have to figure it out on the fly may actually be able to help them make decisions better in real life. And that's really interesting. Where there's a little bit more research is in the area of cognitive performance training. And this is absolutely fascinating. So what we've realized is there's a, a subset of intelligence, if you will, called fluid intelligence. And this, this type of intelligence is really interesting because it doesn't rely on anything that you've learned in the past. It's essentially how you solve a new novel problem that's been presented to you. And again, we used to think that this was uh, essentially fixed. But some literature from the world of, uh, uh, of rehabilitation and therapeutics as it, as it refers to um, treating people with TBIs or uh, treating Alzheimer's or dementia patients um, has revealed some interesting things. So uh, when we were trying to uh, improve people's memory, we were training them on these very complex uh, or simple to complex memory tasks that help them improve their memory. But some scientists actually took this memory game or this memory drill and tweaked it a little bit. And what they noticed was their they began to see evidence of transference. In other words, not only did they improve their memory abilities, but they also seemed to improve their uh, problem-solving abilities and strengthen their fluid intelligence as well. And this is sort of the basis for commercially available products like Luminosity uh, and other sort of brain games, if you will, that uh, claim to in increase or enhance brain fitness. And while I'm not aware of any evidence that Individually, these commercial products, as they're designed, have been uh, rigorously evaluated or investigated. The science behind them is pretty solid that shows that we can enhance this, this fluid intelligence. So the question in my mind is, what if we could take this, this complex memory tool, this game, and give it a specific um, critical care transport uh, pre-hospital medicine referent. Instead of memory games with shapes and colors and numbers, what if they were drugs and drug dosages um, that you could put in here so you would simultaneously work on your memory skills but also be developing using this complex memory game your fluid intelligence capabilities, your your ability to solve problems and, and make decisions. Wow, that'd be pretty cool if you could do some brain exercise if you will, um, 8 to 10, maybe even 20 minutes a day and improve uh, those cognitive abilities. So I find that fascinating and, and hope to investigate that in the future. Now, we got over knowledge. We talked about cognition. What about skill? How do your technical skills actually get better? Well, again, this is something that's been researched quite a bit, uh, mainly in, in the fields of athletic performance, uh, also the military looking at technical training, and a number of other areas too. And one of the most important things, it turns out, is, you guessed it, practice. That's right, Alan, practice. And... Um, not just any kind of practice, as it turns out, but very deliberate, focused practice. So why do I say deliberate and focused practice? It's because it seems that most of the literature that's evaluated uh, how to train technical skills um, is uh, describes training events where people are very focused on a particular task. So. In sports, for example, how you grip a baseball bat or how you grip a golf club, um, how you hold a football, or in the military, how you hold a weapon system, even how the pad of your finger touches the trigger. So these are all very, uh, very focused and deliberate types of practice where you're really conscious and you think about each step of the skill 
as you're doing it. And this is the kind of focused, deliberate practice that builds a high-fidelity neuromuscular program in your brain, what we think of as muscle memory. So that's an important part of building this program. But um, some people believe that there are other important parts to building this program. And one of those was presented by Dr. Richard Levitan. He talks about incrementalizing medical skills. Um, so his belief, and, and I actually agree with him 100% on this based on uh, reviewing some of the literature and also my personal experience in the military, that breaking things down to individual steps is important. So incrementalization may be a really important part of this. And it makes sense if you think about um, the foundation of a building or a house is probably the most important part because everything else is built upon that. Going back to the individual steps might also be important too. I think it's the foundation of skills performance. And uh, some people think about it and they say, well, we always do that, right? We always train skills in some sort of stepwise fashion. But do we really, do we really break it down that far? So think about it. When you learned how to intubate, did you really think about exactly where your fingers were on the laryngoscope or how they were sliding down the tongue or how the, the, the tip of that, uh, that MAC blade was engaging the hyaloepiglottic ligament? Did you really think about each individual small piece of that procedure? Well, I don't know. I know I didn't. So I'm going back and I'm thinking about that, uh, that as well too. And the key here, I think, is to go back Focus on these individual steps and practice them over and over and over and over and over again until we begin to build this high-fidelity program. And what's more important is as that high-fidelity program becomes ingrained, if you will, in the brain, it goes from this sort of conscious area of your brain that deals with working memory to the more unconscious areas of your brain. When you look at people who have developed powerful habits, um, actually the part of their brain that uh, lights up when they're doing something that is involved in executing certain skills is different. So novices, people who are experienced and they actually have to think about what they're doing, that's uh, usually sort of in the area of the working memory of the brain. When it becomes unconscious, sort of like tying your shoe or a habit that you have, it actually lives in a different area of the brain that coordinates movements at sort of this unconscious level in the basal ganglia. So I think that's really important. Why? Because from a neuroscientific basis, it takes less energy to run those motor programs uh, when they become unconscious, right? Think about it. If you, you can tie your shoe and you can have a conversation with someone because you've tied your shoes every day, almost every day of your life, right? Well, I think that's the exact same way it should be with procedures like uh, airway procedures. Uh, I would I would submit that uh, when you have a really bad airway or it's an emergency and you need to RSI or intubate a patient, you have so much going on that you need to reserve those higher functions, that working memory, that conscious part of your brain for all those other things. And the unconscious part of your brain should be the, the solid, high-fidelity motor program that allows you to uh, effectively perform laryngoscopy. So I think that's the, that's the cognitive part behind this training. So that is knowledge, cognition, and skill. But you know what? I want to touch on one other thing real quick. And that is something else that Aristotle talked about, which is pathos, passion. When we're teaching and we're training, sharing our excitement and our passion about a topic with people. Because I mean, when you think about it, think back to some of the classes that you've been in. When you've had instructors or teachers that just kind of drone on and on like Ben Stein. And you know it's sort of obvious that, that they're being paid to be here. And uh, they don't seem too into it or too excited. And now think about some time when you've had a professor or a teacher or someone training you who is just, just really into it. Just really excited. 
I think most of us would say that the experience with someone who was more enthused, more excited, was actually much better. And we walk away remembering more, taking more out of that experience. Actually, some of the sociology literature shows that passion is, could be actually contagious. If you take people who exude, quote unquote, positive emotions, they're happy and charismatic and smiling, and you put them in a room with people with very low amounts of quote-unquote positive emotions, sort of depressed, upset, not really too thrilled, without talking to one another, without really interacting very much with one another at all, just kind of seeing each other in the room, guess what? The mood of those people with low positive emotions is actually elevated. It actually increases. And when we share our passion, not only can we do that, when we do that, when we, when we uh, make people feel better, or we share our excitement and we share our passion, that experience becomes more memorable. If you take investors looking at investing millions of dollars in individual products and they see numerous presentations or sales pitches and then you ask them hey you know what do you remember the most which presentations do you remember the most and what makes them so memorable on a long list of 30 plus things passion as it turns out is like number three number three or number four something like that and uh, that's incredible. Ahead of you know how the person uh, spoke their vocabulary or where they went to school or their perceived level of intelligence, uh, and that's pretty impressive. So, share your passion. Again, you know, I, I think about uh, these experiences uh, that I've had going to some paramedic or medical refreshers where you just, you're just not looking forward to it because we know they're boring and dry sometimes with people just reading off slides or, you know, uh, just uh, intubating uh, mannequin heads. And, oh, man, it's such a drag. You just want to fall asleep just thinking about it. Why does it have to be that way? I think it doesn't have to. I think we can change the way we teach. I think we can look at how we train and say, hey, you know, we know that the brain works best this way, so why don't we change it? Why don't we alter, why don't we put in the time and effort to change the way we teach to make it better? And I think if we do that, not only are we going to uh, increase what, what people learn, the information they take away, uh, educate them, but we're also going to inspire them. We're going to have them leaving there ready to take on the world, ready to go out there and really impact people's lives. And I think that's what it's all about, is preparing people to go out there into the pre-hospital environment, in the transport environment, and improve patient care. So in review, the logic behind everything, the logos, looking at, uh, looking at how the brain works. When we're transmitting knowledge, think about those five T's. When we look at how to improve people's problem-solving ability and decision-making ability, I think simulation is a really great way. Uh, and not sort of weak sauce simulation, but really, really uh, giving people challenges that challenge their ability to make clinical decisions on the spot. And also look at, in the future, cognitive performance training, coming up with games or, uh, or tools, using the technology that we have at our fingertips to give people exercise or ways to improve their fluid intelligence. And finally, skills. Really drilling things, uh, going over and breaking it down, incrementalizing things into individual small little pieces and deliberately practicing those pieces in sequence to develop these high fidelity motor programs that you can perform with very low drag on the brain when the chips are down and you're really in a stressful situation. And finally, once again, share your passion and enthusiasm. Get out there and, and really inspire people. And finally, thank you very much for, for listening to this. I hope you guys have enjoyed it and taken something away from it. Um, this QR code will link you to uh, a all of my notes, 10 pages worth of notes and writing and all of the references, the numerous references that I use to build this presentation. Uh, if you don't have a QR reader and you, you want this information, feel free to go ahead and uh, and email me at michael.j.loria at hitchcock.org. Thank you very much for your time. Take care. Bye-bye.